You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 29, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, food allergy in children. Our presenter is Dr. Kelsey Leaker. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. Uh, today is July 29, 2013. We're very fortunate today to be uh, joined by Dr. Kelsey Leaker. Dr. Leaker uh, is a uh, pediatric resident here at Children's Mercy Hospitals. She's been uh, rotating through the allergy clinic for the last month, and um, she's agreed to give a little presentation on uh, evaluation and management of food allergy in children. So thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Lieber. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I want to start off by saying that I kind of aimed my talk for the general pediatrician, because that's what I'm interested in going into. Um, and I think food allergy is really interesting and something that obviously gets over um, some general you just use the oh. arrows to go back and forth. Oh, perfect. Some general information on food allergies. So I'll go over kind of the definition, of the natural history in terms of um, how it's diagnosed and, and progresses and who it affects, um, the prevalence, um, how these patients present and what sort of symptoms they have, and then um, really focus on evaluation and then management, of course. So what is a food allergy? Um, it's an immune response induced by exposure to a particular food protein. And so the protein is really the allergen um, or the antigen. Antigen is it, There's an IgE-mediated response or a type 1 immediate hypersensitivity reaction. Um, there's also some non-IgE-mediated food allergies, um, specifically, I guess, for example, like celiac disease or um, kind of an atopic dermatitis that's flared by a milk allergy is an example of kind of that non-IgE mediated as opposed to <clears throat> eating a peanut and within an hour, you know, having cutaneous reaction. That's more the IgE mediated type 1 hypersensitivity um, that has the risk of progressing to anaphylaxis that we all kind of think about. And the natural history of food allergy um, you know, commonly affect children or acquired in, in childhood. And, and there's a list, <clears throat> excuse me, of the most common food allergies, with cow's milk being the most common. Um, but cow's milk is also uh, an allergen that, that a lot of children grow out of as they get older. And so um, also listed there eggs, peanuts, soy, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and wheat. Um, and as you can see there, that the most common allergens in adults are just the peanuts, tree nuts, and seafood. And so a lot of the allergens listed above um, do have a higher potential of, of the patient growing out of those allergies as they get older. Um, I read in an article that um, soy allergy typically resolves by pre, um, by, uh, is it adolescence? Or no, by preschool. And wheat allergies typically resolve by adolescence. Um, in terms of the prevalence of uh, food allergies, overall in the general population it's 1 to 2 percent with the peak um, prevalence occurring in the first two years. And, and I read that, you know, it really peaks at 5 to 10 percent at about one year of age. Um, and studies looking at the prevalence of food allergies um, kind of vary. You have to really specify or um, confirm a diagnosis of food allergy because if you ask 100 parents, a third of them are going to report, report some sort of adverse food reaction, um, whereas the rate of an actual food allergy is going to be less than, you know, a third. It's more than that 5 to 10 percent because a lot of parents will think, you know, a contact dermatitis around the mouth after eating strawberries or um, ketchup uh, or some sort of contact dermatitis, they'll report that as an actual allergy when, in fact, if those kids had specific testing done, they um, wouldn't necessarily be positive for a food allergy or had an oral challenge that was witnessed. Um, in terms of presentation, so I think 
we've all seen patients come in um, with concern for a food allergy where they have the hives and maybe the lip swelling or some form of angioedema, um, periorbital swelling. Um, but 20% of cases of anaphylaxis can occur without any cutaneous findings, which I thought was interesting um, because you almost always expect or ask you know, about the history of hives and, and any sort of oral swelling or face, facial swelling. Um, but other symptoms that can occur in conjunction with the cutaneous reactions or without in those 20% of cases. Um, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Oral symptoms, um, including you know, just itching in the throat or the back of the mouth, um, the lips, swelling of those areas. And then respiratory symptoms, um, anywhere as mild as sneezing and runny nose, all the way up to bronchoconstriction, wheezing, and airway obstruction. And here's just a couple pictures, hives in the upper left there, some angioedema on that lower left side, and then um, a potential vomiting occurrence there on the upper right and <laughs> in the lower right. In terms of evaluation, um, if I have learned anything this month, it's been that you need a history to support a possible food allergy. And so really being specific in terms of when the ingestion occurred and then how long after that ingestion um, the symptoms started and you know what exactly was ingested or what ingredients could have been involved. Um, and then reproducibility of course. Um, of course, some parents you know may not recognize symptoms the first time if it were a mild reaction and then maybe they give that kid you know, the, the allergen a second time and then it's more significant. And so recognizing <clears throat> what the symptoms are and the description of those symptoms and then whether or not they're reproducible. Um, skin prick testing and, and blood testing. So skin testing and blood testing are both great tests to rule out allergies. So if they're negative, um, you know, you have almost a 95% chance that that is truly negative. But if they're positive, it, it's not as helpful. Um, and so that's why the history is so important. And so I've heard several people say this month, you know, that unless you have a history, don't do the testing. So a kid who comes in and has been tested to a panel of foods um, but never had a history to support any sort of reaction to those, that's almost worthless information because you truly don't know unless they've had that exposure or had that history um, whether or not that's a true or a false positive in terms of the testing and how that occurs. Um, skin prick testing, uh, the children have to be off of any antihistamine um, for anywhere from three to seven days prior to the testing, preferably um, five to seven days is I think what we tell the patients here. Um, so off of there's their ticker claritin and then when they come in they have um, a control and a histamine control so that they can compare, you know, the size of the hive with the after small scratches introducing the antigen into the skin. Um, and then blood testing or in vitro testing, um, measuring the specific IgE to that particular food or allergen. And again, both of those are very sensitive but um, have that high false positive rate. And then really the gold standard um, is a double blind placebo controlled challenge. Um, in terms of, of confirming a positive food allergy. And again, that kind of goes with history. Um, you know, if they're going to have clinical symptoms and react to um, an allergen, then you would see that on an oral challenge. Um, something else in terms of, of history and the um, challenge. Uh, oh, I just lost my thought. We've seen here. Oh, I'll come back back to it. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. Um, so, in terms of management, um, obviously avoidance is is key. And um, for those cases where the allergen isn't, it's not straightforward and, and clear. Um, really, even keeping a food diary and then tracking, you know, whether whether or not symptoms occurred, whether or not the food was avoided or, or reduced. Um, is important and then lots and lots of education regarding how to read food labels and ingredients and checking for advisory warnings. You know, a lot of uh, food labels will say processed in a 
factory that contains tree nuts or peanuts or something like that. So that's important to, to recognize and teach parents how to look for those sorts of warnings on labels. Um, how to prepare safe meals at home in terms of cooking. You know, some highly sensitized patients may have reactions um, to aerosolized proteins of foods that are cooked. Um, let's say they're boiled or cooked somehow, and then um, breathing goes in, has the potential to cause a reaction in those highly sensitized patients. And then, then how to avoid allergens in a restaurant. If you have a shellfish allergy, it's probably not the best idea to go to a restaurant that specializes in seafood because there's a good chance that at some point uh, their meal would have been um, and then how to avoid allergens in non-food products, just one example, you know, the fact that the influenza vaccine contains an egg protein and so um, just making sure parents are aware of that if, it, if their um, child has an egg allergy, that that might be something that <clears throat> they need to avoid. And then other ways of management and treatment, of course, pharmacotherapy with Benadryl and then um, epinephrine subcutaneously with an EpiPen uh, if you're concerned for anaphylaxis. Um, another uh, topic or issue that came up recently with a patient we saw in clinic was a mom was concerned she had a five-year-old with a peanut allergy and she'd recently had twins that were five weeks old and she was, she'd been avoiding peanuts in her diet because she had read that you know, protein, food proteins have the potential to cross into the breast milk and she was concerned you know, that her newborns could potentially be sensitized or um, develop an allergy to peanuts if she were to ingest tree nuts or peanuts. And so um, I've heard that there's different minds of thought regarding that, that there is the potential and there have been case reports of, of reactions in babies um, by, by ingesting a protein that passed through the mom's breast milk. But um, in terms of whether or not to avoid and the recommendation on that, I know here I've, I've heard that people don't um, recommend that moms necessarily avoid it unless the child, of course, has a reaction. So if that infant seems to have an uh, allergic reaction to something, then, of course, it would be best for that mom to keep an allergy, find out exactly what that is if she doesn't already know, and then to avoid that um, while she's breastfeeding. But um, breastfeeding is definitely recommended up to at least four to six months of age. Um, and in terms of patients and whether or not to delay introduction of foods, of course, in the last few years, the recommendation of delaying eggs until after a year of age and peanuts or tree nuts until after two years of age has gone away. And now it's really the recommendation is only breast milk until four to six months of age and then introduction of solid foods, you know, one at a time. Um, as general pediatricians would typically discuss introduction, introduction of solid foods, but there's really no um, no recommendations in terms of delaying introduction of foods as long as um, you know they can have smooth peanut butter as long as it's not a choking hazard um, as early as that you know six to twelve months of age whenever parents are comfortable with appropriate monitoring of course for any any reaction. Here's a fun allergy comic joke that I found. So it's knock knock who's there? Free cash, free cashew, free cashew. No thanks, I'm allergic. <laughs> And those are my references. Awesome. You did um, a great job of bringing in everything you learned this month. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And um, you did a great job of just not reading off your slides. So congratulations. That was exactly what we want you to take away from um, being able to do this. You did wonderful. There's a couple corrections I'd make. One, you said at the beginning that um, uh, when you get uh, a um, atopic derm flare from eating food. It's not IgE mediated. It's probably IgE mediated. But a good example um, of non-IgE mediated uh, reaction uh, would actually be a contact rash. So if okay. you actually touch the food and, and that locally right there, um, you can have a contact rash. Unfortunately, one of the big problems in food allergy right now is the general public thinks of um, any reaction to food as an allergy, so even lactose intolerance or caffeine intolerance, um, whereas practitioners typically think of an allergy as immune medi mediated. So you do have to uh, keep in mind there's a whole spectrum. You definitely zeroed in on IgE and non-IgE immune medi mediated, but there's pharmacologic and all kinds of other things that folks in the general public will refer to as a food allergy. So like you mentioned, history is very important to understand exactly what, uh, how that person's defining allergy. 
it's semantics. We don't need to be on the same page. We just need to have an understanding. Um, you also mentioned egg protein is in um, flu vaccine, but uh, the official recommendation these days is it doesn't matter. Um, we give them in our clinic and we just watch there's no skin testing that needs to be done. The risk is very low. There's not enough egg in the flu vaccine to be of concern. Okay. And then you had a question about peanuts during pregnancy and, and breast milk. So there's a paper um, by Wesley Burks not too long ago that showed that there's a three times greater risk of sensitization to peanut at birth if you had peanut during um, pregnancy, but there was not, uh, they didn't look clinically. So just because there's higher sensitization doesn't mean there's actually higher activity. It may be that early sensitization is normal. We just don't know. So we haven't changed our practice. We don't have patients pull out peanuts during pregnancy. We let them make their own determination. Breast milk actually delivers all allergies um, uh, connected to an IgG. So um, we, we definitely don't encourage taking out of breast milk for prevention because we think it's probably the safest way your gut can take up a food protein once learning to process it the first time is attached to the IgG. Um, but some of this is um, maybe um, a moot point because it seems like kids may be predestined to be food allergic from the moment they're born. Anyway, wonderful job. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the food thing has gotten, gotten, gone crazy recently. You, know, the, you mentioned about looking in the labels and raising awareness and making sure. And that, that was an issue a long time ago when people weren't as aware. but. Nowadays, some parents become sort of over vigilant about the foods, and you know, become you know hyper vigilant, and you know, will uh, actually make unreasonable uh, requests. I was in Chicago this weekend at the Joint Task Force meeting, and just by coincidence, Friday night on the local news, there was a story of a family with two uh, ch children in a school, and the family insisted that their kids were li you know life threatening reaction to peanut and demanded that half of the tables in the cafeteria had to be become free, peanut free. Half of the tables. They were insisting on that. Now, the school district refused to do it, and the way the news story read out is that the parents were trying to protect their children, and the mean old school district refused to accommodate their, their needs. School's reply was, well, it's not really feasible because we've got kids with other allergies too, and if half of them are peanut, the other half be milk, and then what about the weed and the soy and all the other? I mean, what do you? You can't do that. They were going to offer them three tables in the cafeteria. The parents didn't think that was enough peanut-free tables. The kids were being bullied, and they were also very unhappy because nobody would sit next to them in the cafeteria. Everybody, nobody liked them. Basically, they were pariahs in the, in the school because of this. And so the school's response was that the parents might have to homeschool them. Uh, never once did they interview an allergist or a physician in this news story, uh, nor did they question whether the kids were actually allergic to the peanut or whether this kind of exposure was really a threat to their health. That, that was never questioned. It was just assumed that the parents were right and that the school district was mean and unaccommodating. It's, it's just an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. Anyway, so thank you. Yeah. Very, very good. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.